Last week, we talked about uh, parenting, but really the, the goal of parenting. We talked about the idea that we are privileged stewards of our children, and we are called to move them from dependency on us to dependency on the Lord. And we talked about how, like, a lot of times in our society, uh, our children lead us when we're called to lead them. And so what does that look like to be intentional in leading our family. So if you haven't seen that one, I advise you to go back and take a look at that. Um, but I also want to premise this series by saying this. I know that some of you, you're, you're not parents, and you don't have a family yet, uh, like we're going to talk about. Uh, maybe you do have a family, maybe you're in the family, uh, but you don't have kids. And, and I want to just encourage you. This message today, though it's about parenting, this will apply to you. So if you have a notebook, um, write these principles down, because in reality, these are biblical principles about how to build relationships with people, how to disciple them. Um, and so these, these carry. And so uh, if, don't, don't feel disconnected. Don't, don't feel like this doesn't apply to you. In fact, I would encourage you to write down some of these concepts and these principles and extend them to your friendships uh, in your life, maybe nephews, nieces. There's a lot of relationships in your life, a lot of different dynamics that you can apply this to. But we are talking to parents um, about consistent parenting this morning. And uh, I want to open up with a picture. And so, take a look. Uh, this is me and my mother. And so, you can say, ah, oh, that's okay. So, this is, this is me and my mother. Uh, so, I am young. I'm probably maybe seven, eight years old. And my mom. And, and this picture in context, I'm a, I was a competitive swimmer when I was a kid. So, I travel a lot swimming. And so, this is a swim meet. And I don't know which one. I don't, I don't remember. But this is one of my favorite pictures of my mother and, my, and, and I. And I wanted to show you this for a couple reasons. Um, what we're going to talk about today, I believe, is displayed in this one image. Okay, so here's what I want you to notice in this image. Um, one is that my mother is embracing me. She's got her arm around me, and she is um, just embracing me in my fear. Obviously, look at my eyes. I'm, I'm afraid. Um, there's something going on. I'm nervous, and I'm trying to contemplate whether or not I can do it. I also want you to notice something about this picture. Uh, she is speaking life into me, isn't she? So she is, and I don't remember what she said, but I'm sure she, she called me Johnny. So <laughs> I'm sure she said something like, you know, you could do it, Johnny. I believe in you. Um, you know, you got this. Uh, but I also want you to notice one other thing about this picture, okay? Uh, she's present. She's there. Um, and those are the three things uh, that we're talk about and how that, that models consistent parenting that we should have in the home. But look at me, I want to also say this. Um, I was gifted to have this mother. And I recognize that. And for some of you in your room, when you think about your parents, um, this is not what you think about. Because they weren't there. And they didn't speak life. Um, and they didn't embrace in a loving and warming way. So, so here is the goal this morning because of that. Um, one, I want you to say and hear that God is loving us in a way that he's calling us to reflect towards our children. So we're going to talk about how God loves us, which is like this. And why it's so important as we grow in our love and understanding of who God is, we receive his love and then we echo that love into our homes and our children. But I also want you to know that the second agenda this morning is this. Though you may not have had this type of parent in your life, for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus, you do now. And scripture says that God is the father to the fatherless. And so though you may not have had this, for those who have placed their faith in Jesus, you now do have a God who wants to bring you comfort. He wants to bring you his warm embrace, his life-giving word for you. You have this now. So God can allow you this morning to forgive the parents who did not give you this, to heal from that, but to move forward knowing that in the relationships in your life, whether it's with a child, a nephew, a friend, or whoever God has given you in your life to point towards Jesus, you can love them well because you are loved well. You following me? Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to have you turn to Mark chapter 10, and I want to pick up on this verse in verse 13. Now, here's the context. Jesus is going about his ministry. He is teaching he is healing. He is loving people. And everyone was coming around him. They were following him. They, they listened to his words because Jesus is God incarnate. He was obviously speaking words that they never heard before, powerful, life-giving words. 
And so he is traveling around, and then there's a scene here in Mark where Mark acknowledges that there was this group of people, and we're going to read it together in verse 13, who had children. Now look how Jesus responds to the children, because it's going to teach us a lot about our Father's heart. Verse 13, And they were bringing children to him, this is Jesus, so that he might touch them. And the disciples, they, they rebuked him, saying, But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, verse 15, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them and laid hands upon them. Okay, there's a lot here, but here's what I want you to pay attention to. How Jesus, again, Jesus is here. Why does he live? He lives to atone for our sins. He lived to die for that which we could not atone for, meaning he took on the penalty of our sins on the cross. That was his primary goal. But he also came to teach us about the Father's heart, about who God is, his purpose for our lives, his will for his life, why he created us. He was here to teach us about the fundamental questions of life. And so anything Jesus does is modeling the triune God's, God's heart. And so I want you to know, okay, this is God's heart towards children. And as Christ followers, this is our heart towards people, especially our children. So notice one thing. The first thing you notice is that God embraces, the, Jesus embraces these children. He doesn't push them aside. He doesn't see them as a hindrance. He embraces them. Okay, what does that mean? There is a loving touch that is godly. Which also means we got to figure out what is the difference between a loving touch and a polluted, sinful, dehumanizing touch of the world. Because there is a difference between a touch that brings comfort and peace and warmth and a touch that's rooted in sin and depravity. But I want you to know that God is a God of physical affection. He loves you. In fact, Jesus is often pictured in Scripture as this uptight kind of figure in some of the Christian movies where, where he's just always rebuking people or he's always kind of stern. But in reality, when you study the Scripture, you will see that Jesus dances, that he hugs, that he goes to parties. Not, not sinful parties, but parties where there's laughter and joy and fellowship and community. In fact, in Scripture, it says in Luke 7 that Jesus was accused of being too joyful. So there, there is something about the Father's heart that is warm and embraces. And so then, as parents, we are called to embrace our children in the way that God embraces our souls. Which means, here's the good news, that, that if you have an infant in this room, you are to hold that infant often and kiss that infant and embrace that infant. Do you know that literally if the child is not touched, there's been studies about this. There's been orphanages where children are just fed, just provided for, and they pass away. That there's a power and a touch. Some of you nurses, you know this, that, that actually now when you have a child, they, what do they do with that newborn? They put it on the flesh of the mother, do they not? All these health benefits are coming out, shocker, from the warm embrace of the mother and the father. And so God has authored this idea of embracing our children in a way that brings comfort and trust and safety the way our Father does to us. And so if you have young children, men and women, look at me. As your pastor, I'm going to encourage you, play with your children. My daughters, we got all these things that, that, that are actively playful touch in our home. My daughters love to hold my hands and walk up my body and flip. And so my youngest, Autumn, she just figured it out. So my life at home consists of just constant flipping <laughs> as I, like, get milk. And I was like, thank you for teaching Autumn this, right? And then eventually they're, like, too heavy, and <laughs> you, like, fall back. You're like, you're done. You're done with the flipping. My, my home is one where we go up on the bed upstairs, and I take the, the girls' ankles, and I flip them. And they flip on my bed trying to land. We do tons of things. I have this game where I have this blanket, and um, my daughters run around, and I throw the blanket over them, and I kidnap them, and I throw them in the jail couch. <laughs> and then they run off. And they say, do it again. And I'm like, okay. So 16 times, I put them in the jail couch. But you know, hopefully, that children love embrace. They love upside down hanging. They love playfulness. This is so important. 
that you are a person that teaches them what it looks like to have true love and embrace that is reflective of God's heart, not the polluted world. And so we are to model what is right about touch. And for those who are rooted in this idea that your touch of your children, guys, I'm going to warn you, this is a hard message. Good message, hard message, hopefully convicting. For those that have shown nothing but evil touch, angry touch, I pray you repent. That's no place in the home of those who claim the blood of Jesus. None. We're going to talk about this in a couple weeks. You don't even discipline out of anger. So for some of you, you need to repent and say, I have taught evil and angry touch, and that is not of the Lord. Why is that important? Because what we model in our children's lives, they will think is what God is. If you think God is an angry, mean, tyrant, often your parents have failed to show you the true nature of your Lord. He is not that. He is gentle and kind. And this passage reflects the heart of our Lord. And so we are to embrace. If you have teenagers, parents, you are to actively pursue your teenagers with touch, appropriate touch. You are to hold your daughter's hand and walk through the woods. You are to wrestle with your son and arm wrestle him until he's stronger than you and then be humbled. so important that you embrace a loving, comforting touch in your home. So important that you repent and ask for forgiveness if you haven't or when you don't. But I can tell you, a loving, comforting, warm embrace of a teenage girl has the potential to guard her heart against running after the world because she's starving for it. Some of you young girls are starving for the affection that your father is not giving you, and you think you're going to find it in that boy. Don't you dare run to that boy. You run into the arms of the Lord. That boy will use you and abuse you, and if he doesn't love the Lord, he will not love you the way you deserve. But men and women, we are to model that love and that embrace in a way that doesn't create starvation in our children. Did you hear me? Okay, very important. In fact, one of the things I've learned pretty early on when it comes to the loving embrace of our Father is that if we do not have that picture I showed you, if we don't have an understanding of who God is, if it wasn't modeled in our home, many of us have a hard time understanding that this God who created us is a loving, forgiving God. Because there's never been an authority figure in our lives that was like that. So I want to share with you that God is not a God who who is angry at you. He is a God who wants you to find rest in him. I promise you that though it's not a physical touch, God will bring a comfort to your soul as you pursue him. And anybody who's ever experienced pain and grief in your life, you know that the comfort and the warmth that you will find in your pain and suffering in the Lord, no man can give you. No person can give you the embrace that the Lord can give you in your suffering. And so this heart that God has to embrace us, to bring comfort to our souls in the midst of pain and hurt, is the same embrace we are to reflect to our children so that they understand that God is good and that he's loving. You know, my parents had foster children growing up, and one of the things that was very clear was when, when these young children would come into the home and they did not have that embrace, You know why? Because oftentimes, as a family who love to hug and love to build up and and encourage and put our arms around each other, um, we would attempt to do that, and they would flinch. And I remember as a young child saying, why why do they flinch? And my parents saying, they they don't know what it means to be lovingly embraced. They're afraid of embrace. And at that moment, I knew there's a difference. There's a difference between an embrace that you run to just like the arms of the Father, because you know there's comfort there and an embrace that you're afraid of. And my question to you, Christ followers, is which embrace are you modeling in your home? Which embrace? And if your children flinch when you come around them, you got to give that to the Lord. you got to fix whatever's broken and how you approach this. And for some young men and young women and older men, who are devaluing women every day on your television screen or on your computer screens, that will play out in your home. And the enemy will use that pollution of value to corrupt your family. So guard your eyes. It will come out in your touch. 
We're not going there deep, but we should eventually. Because that is a stronghold that keeps us from embracing the people in our lives the way God calls us to. Here's the second one I want you to notice. Look, notice in this passage that not only does he embrace and he's warm, but he also is present with the children. He doesn't tell the disciples to go tell these children this. He says, bring the children to me. I have a message for them. Not only is he embracing them, but he's saying to them that that the kingdom of God is going to be like them. Now, this is a whole other message, but what he's talking about is not the childish ways of children. It's the childlikeness of their wonder and their belief and their blind trust in knowing that Jesus is their comforter and their savior. It's this idea that they're not doubting things, but they're fully putting their trust and faith in Jesus. And this beautiful wonder that children have, this innocence that the children have, is what God is calling out to say, this is what the kingdom of God is like. But I want you to notice this. Why does the disciples keep the children initially from Jesus? Well, this is this context of culture. So imagine a culture that doesn't worship children. Our culture does. Our culture worship youth. We say youth is wise, youth is right. Most cultures would say, no, youth is foolish and they need to learn. We're the only ones that worship children. But, but in this culture, here's what happened. If you had a person like Jesus who was this prophetic teacher who, who had great reverence and was healing, children were seen as not yet. So children weren't, they, they, they didn't have the respect to come up to a teacher like that. The teacher's time was too valuable. The teacher needed to speak to the to people and the, the chiefs and the, and the rulers and the people that actually could make a difference. They couldn't teach teach the children. And so it wasn't that the disciples didn't like children. It was the same as imagine a a president doing a speech and a bunch of children running up and playing on the stage. And you'd say, well, no, no, no. You can't do that at that moment. Not when the president's there. This is what's happening. And so Jesus is literally humbling his status before the culture, and he's embracing the fact that, no, 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 it's actually valuable that these children hear what I have to say and experience my presence. That's why That's why this is a church that values the next generation. We don't hide them in a corner of the the church. In fact, we elevate the need to disciple them well. Why? Because Jesus does. But he also gives them his presence, which is really, really the key to this passage. In fact, when Jesus says that that I am to to teach you something, he says that that this is something I want to tell you, that that unless you become a little child, he says this in in Matthew Chapter 18, he says, unless you become a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of God. So now he's using them as a testimony, and he's teaching them that that they have more meaning and more purpose than they think they do. So why is it important to be present with your children? Presence is so important if you want to model God's love, because God is present with us. Not only is he present with the least of these when he lived in, in this earthly ministry, and he taught us the heart of the Lord, but he is present in our lives. You never will go to God in your time alone in devotions, and God says, I'm ha- I have a bad day today. Come back tomorrow. You will never find that. You will find a constant pursuit of his presence for us who are willing to step into it. So Lord, help me to be fully present with my children the way that you are fully present with me. So what does that look like? Well, for some of you, you have a young infant at home. And men, I want to talk to you for a moment. There is a tendency when you have a child to have something like this go, go down. You have a child. The child is very attached to your wife because she feeds that child. And you feel like all your expectations about what your child should be like and how they should treat you falls to the wayside because your child screams when you hold them. And, and what the enemy is going to say is disconnect. Don't be involved. Just give it to your wife and leave the room. Do something that that feeds your selfishness. But I'm going to call you out and say this. When you have a young child, you ought to be fully present in whatever capacity you can be. So you got the diapers because your wife's feeding. You're going to take the child, and though she's screaming, guys, pay attention to me. You're not going to give her back. You're going to take a walk. And you're going to pray over your child as they scream. You're going to be present because look at me. God is present when we scream at him. So we don't give up though we're not liked. Nope. We don't give up if, if, even though we don't feel valuable. Nope. We are present and we are active. If you have young children, you are present. You are not just with them. We talked about this last week. What does that mean? It means you could be sitting on the couch 
with your family and not be present. Present means you fight the phone and you take a walk. You fight the phone and you're with your children and you talk to your children. You, you, you fight the phone and you go upstairs every night at bedtime. Intentional presence. And you sit on the bed with your child and you read them a devotion and you ask them how you can pray for them. And you ask them about their day. You're intentionally present at the dinner table, which means you fight the phone and the TV and you sit at the dinner table and you say, highs and lows today, go. It's the best part of your day. What's your worst part of the day? Because our Father does not ignore us. We are called to be present and intentional with our children. Our teenagers need our presence. Okay, a couple convictions coming up here. Get ready. If your child wants nothing to do with you, they are reflecting what they see. So if you're not intentional and self-sacrificing and wanting to be with them, and asking open-ended questions, and, and dying to self so that you can grow in your relationship with Jesus, do not expect your children to be that way to you. So if, if they push you away, it's because you are pushing them away in what you're doing. So when you don't have time for them, or you're not present with them, you are teaching them to not be present. So, so here's a conviction, okay? I'm with you. This is a battle. If you're always on your phone, but you complain that your children are always on their phone. And the enemy's clapping. Because God wants so much more. But you got to be present. You got to be present with your family, your wife, the people in your life, your coworkers. This doesn't just apply to children. Because look at me. God is present with us. With your, with your adult children, those who are empty nesters but have a jaw, I'm going to encourage you here. A lot, of, a lot of times, people don't give you advice on this. And I know I'm younger than you, but listen to me. This is, this is godly advice. This is, this is scripture. You are to be life-giving in your presence with your children, not sucking, sucking their life away. Meaning, this is what I mean. If you're a parent, you are not to then have your child leave your home, go to another home, and you constantly wanting to pull them back into your home. This is what our family does with our tradition. This is how I want you to teach and, and raise your children. You are not to do that. But here's what you are to do. You are to go to that house and say, you know what? You guys haven't had a time away yet. I care about your marriage. How about you go on a date? I'll watch the kids. Hey, you're really, you're really having a tough time with your children. Um, I, I'm going I'm to clean your house because I'm a support I want this family to be strong. I want your relationship to be strong. You lift up and you build up in your presence. You don't tear down and destroy in your presence. That's how you parent your adult kids. You, you, you're present, and your presence helps to create health. It doesn't hurt it. Because if it hurts it, you haven't given the Lord your children yet. But we talked about last week. The goal was for your children and their husband and their wife and their children to depend on the Lord, not you. Here's, here's one of the things I want to um, just share personally about how God wants to experience his presence. I, I have a father who I love dearly. He wasn't a perfect man, but I love him dearly. He was a consistent, faithful man. I remember him used to journal um, when the pastor spoke at our small church. And I used to think, that's so awesome that my dad wants to know the word. Um, but I didn't know my dad because he was working all the time. He had a bunch of boys, punk, big, prideful boys. Not me and my brother. <laughs> and, a, and a daughter who was very, very stern and, and uh, foster kids. I mean, I don't blame the guys. Like, he's just trying to feed, feed a bunch of mouth. But he's working a lot. And he got laid off a bunch. And, um, but you know what? My, you know how I, I got to know my dad? He's hunting. My dad had a bunch of boys. And at 12 years old, we would get our license, and we would go out hunting with my dad. And when we were younger, from 12 to probably 15, we would hunt with my dad in the tree stand. And we would hunt with my dad at the, you know, when we did rifle. And so I got to know my dad. I got to know um, 
what he was like as a kid. I got to know his childhood crush. I got to know uh, what kind of athlete he was. I got to know his college friends. I got to know my dad just by intentional time. And to be honest with you, I liked that part way more than hunting when I was a kid. I knew that I had an opportunity to get to know my dad if I went hunting. And the power wasn't in the hunting. The power was in the presence of just being together. And I would encourage you, there's power in your presence. That's what we talked about last week. Um, maybe, maybe buy less gifts and move towards experiences in your home so your kids can experience who you are. And you can share, not, not your perfection, but, but what God did in your life, what he took you through, how he carried you through. Powerful, powerful thing if we show presence. Here's the last thing I want to point out here. Look back at this passage. Not only does Jesus embrace them, not only does he speak to them, but he teaches them. He teaches them. He teaches them about what the kingdom of God would be like and that they are blessed. And not only that, but he lays hands on them and he blesses them. Paul says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful in building up according to their needs. Paul says that it may benefit those who listen. James says that words can speak and reveal our hearts. Jesus says, and James says, that not only does words reflect our hearts, but words, James says, can, can build up good or evil. It can, it can create blessings or cursings. It can create healing or destruction through our words. And so here's the last one. You are to speak consistent life into your children. And I'll prove why this needs to be intentional. Because in this room, so many people have been spoken to by friends and parents and siblings over the course of their years. But I promise you, nothing has taken root more than what your parents said about you, especially the things they said negatively. Am I right? Like in the moment where you're, you're learning and you're being educated, maybe because of sin, pride, maybe when you're trying to learn, the you're not smart enough pops up in your brain. Maybe you're trying to better yourself. Maybe you're trying to love well and, and you're not good enough pops up in your brain because the people who were called to speak life into you planted a seed of death that you can't shake. The words you speak as a parent can be planted to produce life and foundation. The same way that God's truth, if it's implanted in our lives, changes everything. You are to be life givers in how you speak. And we talked about this in, in many different series leading into today, where so many of us, you are angry with your words because you have an angry heart. But you are to never, never speak angry words to your children. They are to be life-giving words, even in your correction, even in your rebuke, as God does to us. God calls us to something greater. He says, sin no more. Why? Because I have something greater for you. So what does this look like practically? This looks like you speak over your infant child truth. You sing to them, you read them God's word, even if they don't understand it, you are planning from the very beginning the gospel and the good news in the life of your children. You don't know how the Spirit will use that. What does that look like as infants? That looks like you encourage them. We talked about this, remember, when we had the conversation about spiritual gifts? For those who didn't remember, here, here's the difference. Your children will show their spiritual gifts in their childhood. But oftentimes, we actually see that as a weakness, and so that's when we bring condemning words. I'll give you an example. My child gets in trouble all the time, and so I'm constantly yelling at him and saying that he's no good and that he can, he's not going to do anything because he's always getting in trouble. Here's the reality of what God's calling us to. That child is a leader, but he's just living in his flesh. And as a parent, just as God does, you are to say, do you know why you influence other people? Because God made you a leader to point those people towards Jesus. You're just pointing them towards destruction. So I'm going to help you as a parent to make sure you know that that gift set is not for your destruction. It's actually for God's glory. I have a child who's constantly whining, constantly crying, constantly emotionally upset. You say, you need to stop doing that. You're weak, and people are going to take advantage of you rather than God has given you a heart of mercy. Because you have a heart of mercy, you will be sensitive to the world around you. 
and they will try to take advantage of that. But listen to me, that is a gift God's given you, and he's given you the heart of mercy because he wants you to love those who are hard to love, and he wants you to be sensitive to those who are broken around you. That is a gift God's given you. Let's put it on the right path. Do you see the difference? You as a parent are to study and have a master's degree on your children's spiritual gift sets, and you are to use your words to point them towards the greater purpose in their lives. I got a child who's a great athlete. God has given you a platform to make him known. But often what we do is we build self in our children And that self-worship that we cultivate with our words means that your value is in what people say about you. And we create a sandcastle in our children's lives that we ourselves destroy with our words. You, You are to use your words to build up. This is why when you have teenagers, when you have young adults, when you release them from the training phase to to the releasing phase, you become the encourager. You got this. believe in you. Hey, are you starting your day with the Lord? Are you going to the Lord with that? You are life-giving. Your words matter, parents. They matter. And when you use your words to condemn your children, you are to quickly run to them and ask for forgiveness. And that's okay. But you are to be intentionally consistent in using your words to build up. Just as Jesus with the woman at the well says, you were and now you're not. Go sin no more. That's the posture you have with your children. Yes, you are fallen and you are sinful, but you have a Savior. And you talk about the Savior. You point them to the Savior often. You are consistent with your words and building up. I want to show you that picture I showed you from the very beginning. Do you remember this picture of my mother and I? Hasn't been too long. But if you're like me, you may have forgot. Okay. Here's, here's what I want to do. Um, so, so here's why I showed you this picture, okay? My mother taught me imperfectly, but taught me what it meant to be loved by the Lord. She was consistently there. She was a comforter. She was an encourager. She lifted me up and pointed me to, towards Jesus. And imperfectly, God used that, that used that foundation in my life. God used that foundation in my life to let me find God and fall in love with him. When I was 17 years old, I fell in love with the Lord, and I recognized that the things my mom planted in me were shadows of what I found in him. But here's why I want to show you this picture. My mom pointed me towards the treasure. And when I found that treasure, I separated from needing my mom to be that anymore. I loved my mom, but she wasn't my anchor anymore. He was. He's the one I found strength in my weakness. He's the one I found peace in my suffering. He was the treasure my mom pointed me to. But here is the heart and the gift of God in all of this. My my mom, when I was a fully grown adult, having family, she got sick. And my mom had to go to the hospital. And she had a lot of surgeries, and she had a lot of medicine, and she was in a lot of pain. And I remember being in the hospital room, and my mom's lying down in the hospital room, and I remember kissing her on the forehead. I remember hugging her. I remember speaking life to her. And I remember leaving that hospital room and thinking about this picture. This is a true story. And I remember thinking, how amazing is it, Lord, that the woman who showed me your love allowed me to meet you, grow in my love for you and my understanding of how you love so that I can love her the way you love her. That you gave me the gift to love my mom the same way she loved me. Church, this is what God's calling us to. It's to love differently and to love the way that God loves. But the only way you do that is if you know the Lord and you grow in your knowledge and intimacy of Him. This is why this message applies to all of us. Children are just privileged stewards that we're giving to raise, but but everyone in our lives, the way we love well 
is, is for us to grow in our understanding of how God loves us and to reflect that love. And by doing that, God is going to bring his glory all throughout your life, whether it's through when you have no family, whether it's through an infant at home, whether it's through young children at home, teenagers at home, empty nesters, whether you never have children or you have children, you are still going to be able to overflow that love in every relationship you have. And so in, in Scripture... There's this amazing, Pastor Luke reminded me of this, and I forgot to say this last sermon. I'm kicking myself. In John chapter 1, Jesus is calling out his disciples. And he's calling these men who have professions and they're doing all these things. And you know what he says in in chapter 1? He says, come and follow me. He says, come come and follow me. That that if you come and you taste that the good Lord is good and that you rest in his goodness and you learn about how he actually loves you, not how the world says he loves you or people who are bitter towards religion tells you he loves you, but you actually experience the true presence in the living God, you will begin to overflow that love into your home and it will change everything. And so the way we do this, the way we are going to love our children the way God loves us is for us to first love the Lord. So here are some resources. Again, we only have about 35 minutes, and I'm packing a lot into it. But here are some resources that will help you to be intentional and consistent in loving your children. These resources will talk about love languages that are in your home. Your children are loved differently. Quality time, words of affirmation. There there are books here that talk about teenagers and why your daughter acts the way she does and what are her needs when it comes to what God calls her to. It's even going to be a book that tells you about why your, your boy is crazy and climbs on everything. But we are to study our children so that we can point them towards Jesus. So here's what I want, invite you to do as I pray for you. Two things. One, for those who have the gift of relationships in their lives that they're called the steward, I would ask that you pray that the Lord would convict your heart on this. That you'd be more consistent with the time you spend, with the conversations you have, and the, and the warm embrace you hold in your children's lives. But I also would pray for those that come out with a broken family or maybe parents that did not model what we're talking about. I pray that you would find the father to the fatherless this morning. That you would know that you have a father and an example in your life that you can go to to learn how to change that for your children. And I pray you ask and offer forgiveness for those who have failed you in this because God is able, God is able But I also pray that the conversations we have going home is a conversation of conviction. Maybe, men, you need to say to your children, listen, I know I have not used my words to build you up, but to tear you down, will you forgive me? Maybe it's conviction to say, I have not been present with you. We've just been sitting on the couch together, but I haven't been present, and forgive me. Maybe it's embrace. Maybe it's, listen, I'm not a hugger, but I want you to know the love of the Lord, and I want you to feel protected and comforted in our home. And so I'm going to work on how to, how to be a father who protects and embraces their children well. Though you may not have had a father who did, did that, our, our father calls us to that. So church, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask the Spirit to move in this room. Feel free to come up and respond. If you need prayer, stay in your seat. If you need to wrestle with some things, it's just between you and the Lord. But I love you. I'm proud of you because I know every one of you, uh, you're trying. And we need a spirit in order to accomplish this. But we have them. Father, we love you and I thank you that you are calling us to love our children, love the people you have given us to love the way you love. So Lord, thank you for this shadow of your love that we see in Mark. That you are a God who embraces and is intentional with his relationship children, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you help us. Some of us are hurting because all we're thinking about right now is how our parents didn't love us, didn't protect us. Lord, I pray that you would bring about reconciliation, healing. And Lord, I pray for our children, Lord, that despite us trying to do this imperfectly, Lord, I pray that you will do the rest and that our children would be lifelong followers of you and they would know you and that we would be part pointing them towards you. In Jesus' name we pray.